Hello, today is Thursday, October 17th, 2024. I'm Tony Mangino from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. On today's episode, we're going to discuss what continues to be one of the hottest topics of 2024, and that is Contact Center as a Service, or CCAS. I'm joined today by LB3 partner Laura McDonald and TC2 director Julie Gardner. Both Laura and Julie have worked in the CCAS space for years and have insights into the coming changes. Laura and Julie will share what they're seeing and hearing as our clients develop go-to-market strategies and contracts for these services in today's AI buzz world. Laura and Julie, welcome. Thanks. Thank you. So, Julie, let's start with you. You spoke to us back in February about CCAS. Has anything changed in the market? Oh, thanks, Tony. No surprise, but AI continues to dominate the news in the CCAS space. We're seeing AI deliver feature functionality and efficiencies in CCAS areas like call transcription and summarization, predictive capabilities, trending topic detection, sentiment analysis, natural language Q&A, and automated scoring. These areas provide some of the most relevant and compelling use cases that can be tracked and measured against from an AI perspective. That sounds exciting. Has AI interest shifted the playing field in terms of who enterprise customers should consider for CCAS services? That's a great question. The key players really haven't changed. However, we are seeing some new product names and offerings in the OEM portfolio mix. Genesis, for example, has introduced the concept of AI experience tokens into its pricing construct, which includes agent copilot. Copilot includes new features like answer highlight and wrap-up code prediction, and the tokens are purchased in units, which are measured per event, per route, per seat, or per session, depending on the type of cloud product that you're buying. This adds another layer of complexity to the already fairly complex pricing exercise that you need to do in the CCAS world. Yeah, that does sound unduly complex. Laura, what are you seeing from a contracting perspective? Well, Tony, we continue to see clients migrating from on-prem to cloud solution. And as they see AI, for all the reasons Julie just went over, as a critical component of the new solution, they still have to determine how it's going to be used or even if they want to use it. And of course, if they determine that AI is critical, and most are, to the success of this new solution, it's also critical that enterprises fully investigate, understand, and contract for the use of AI and AI-driven features. So one of the things that I would recommend and I'm seeing is that if enterprises don't already have an AI policy, both for their own internal use and for the application to vendor AI use, that policy, they need to get started on the policy right away before any migration. And as challenging as creating these policies are, it's even more challenging to try and retrofit after you've already purchased and implemented something that's as indispensable as a call center solution. Okay, so wait a minute here. How does a client define an AI policy when there's so much that's unknown? Uh, That's the question. And that's a harder one to answer. The short answer is you plan for what you know now and you think hard about what else could happen or what other uses might arise. And this really needs to be done on two levels. First of all, enterprises need a general AI policy and they need specific requirements for each use. So you're talking about two separate platforms. The general AI policy must provide an overarching governance model. And it has to address things like data protection, intellectual property, liability, regulations and ethics, enforcement. And they really should create an ongoing governance board. This is going to come up over and over and more frequently. So get something in place now to address it. You don't want to have to start from scratch. Once that high-level policy is set, then for each use case, an enterprise should start with the fundamental questions, such as what is the AI component? What use of the data is entailed? That's critical. And how sensitive is that information? Where will the data reside and how's it going to be collected and how are you going to retrieve it if you need to, say, if there's a litigation? You need to look at what consents are going to be required and they will be required. And then you have to look at probably the most complex and that is what's the applicable laws. And these are regulations. These are policies. These are court cases. And this is also not a one and done. Each use drive is going to drive different answers and is going to make you looking at different forums. And you have to stay abreast of these. That's one of the reasons a a governance panel is really important. For example, just about two months ago, Tony, we talked about some litigation that was pending that affected AI and CCAS. 
And already that landscape has changed. For sure. So Julie, how does a client approach the market for this? And they need to have an AI policy and governance in place before they go to market for CCAS service? Well, because this is such a rapidly changing area, it's really critical that clients have that AI governance board that Laura just mentioned. That board needs to meet regularly to review its policies, make any updates that may be required based upon the latest developments. Laura highlighted that it's rapidly changing, so really staying abreast and ensuring that you know what those are. Companies are even creating new positions to help with this and the ongoing governance, and that's including a new CAIO or a chief AI officer. Clients really need to have that basic framework defined, but you won't have all the answers before you go to market, and that's okay, but you need to have that framework in place. Thanks, Julie. So, Laura, I'll ask you pretty much the same question. Has AI changed the way in which clients go to market for these services? Well, it's changed the questions they ask but not the process. We always recommend that a company use an RFP to obtain market leading pricing, terms and conditions. And and we still recommend it, but you can't use the same RFP you used three years ago. The world is too different, particularly with AI. The terms and conditions in your RFP, you need to focus on AI specific language that's going to be aligned with these policies that Julie and I have been talking about. And you need to do things like define what you mean by AI, because a lot of people have different perspectives on that. Whether the use is going to be in an open or closed system, whether the vendor can meet your required limitations on use. And this is particularly important if you're taking credit card numbers, you have PCI, you're in the healthcare industry, financial services. So you you really need to think about that and incorporate that learn as you go. And of course, SID's consent is a key component of regulatory compliance. How consent is obtained and what happens if consent is denied is something you need to address right up front. And the RFP is a perfect place to do that. Because remember, you're moving from the cloud. So you have to understand where and how your data is going to be securely stored, cleansed, used, preserved, returned, and kept confidential. And you don't want to find out after you select a vendor that you don't agree on the right to use your company or customer data or what the consent process is and have those not aligned with your ethical or regulatory requirements. So with the AI, it's really critical, and I think Julie just mentioned this, that your IT, legal, cybersecurity, data privacy teams, and that board are engaged for each of these procurements and as you put out the RFP. Yeah, and I'll just add, ultimately, the solution that you pick really needs to address your business objectives. We're, you know, over and over again, improving the customer satisfaction, customer experience, and employee experience are really seen as the most vital in today's contact centers. For most of our clients, the recurring costs and the one-time investment in a new CCAS solution are key factors. So cost is still very important. It's critically important that you understand your use cases, the size of your environment, and your integration requirements. You need to make sure that your cost model contemplates fully your target environment, including extras for things like those AI tokens that Genesis is now charging for that I mentioned earlier. How does an RFP help clients address these issues though? Well, the RFP allows you to define your use cases and set out your AI policy requirements that we've just discussed. But it also provides you with an opportunity to see and compare and understand the solutions and the pricing that Julie just mentioned was so critical that are available in the marketplace. And really, it is the best way to secure the solution that best needs your business objectives at the best price with the best terms and conditions. A CCAS migration most often requires a significant investment of time and money. So it's generally a longer term relationship between the parties and it's a partnership and you need to get it right from the start. So it's important to build in the time to do it correctly. Well, thank you, Laura and Julie, for the really engaging discussion today. It sounds like CCAS solutions continue to evolve at the pace of evolution in the AI space. It's certainly complex and should be addressed thoughtfully, given that it's both customer facing and revenue impacting. And if you'd like to talk to Laura, Julie, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues about your CCAS needs, please give us a call or send us an email. Julie and Laura will be covering CCAS, including how to avoid the major pitfalls in complex CCAS contracting and migration at our upcoming Atlanta conference on October 22nd. If you would like more information on our free conference, please visit us at techcaliber.com or lb3law.com. You can also stay up to date by subscribing to Staying Connected 
again, by checking out our websites and by following us on LinkedIn.